and comes. Hebrews chapter 10 is a verse that's pretty well known maybe to most of us. Hebrews chapter 10 that's addressing a number of things that we are encouraged to do. Let us draw near in full assurance of faith. Let us hold fast the confidence of our hope firm to the end. And then verse 24 that says, Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, or stir up, as some of the versions say. <clears throat> Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. This description of really a summary of what is involved in being a Christian, drawing near to God, responding to His invitation to be a Christian, to, be, to have forgiveness that is in Christ, to be reconciled to God. And then the matter of remaining faithful, of hold fast and not giving up. But this third point that is made in what is sometimes called the salad passages, let us, let us draw near, let us... Hold fast and let us consider one another. This third one really has to do with our responsibilities toward one another and our need to be concerned about encouraging one another. I kind of, I, I quoted, started out quoting from the American Standard. I switched over to the New King James because that's what's in your pews there if you're following along in a pew Bible or uh, what many of you use on a regular basis. But the word provoke was in the old one, and I used to always make a point about that. We're pretty good at provoking each other in negative ways. We can get a reaction. Sometimes you'll see that with siblings. They, they learn how to really get at people and provoke them, uh, their sisters or their brothers, and picking on them in various ways. But in this family of God's people, it should be that we're provoking and, and, and prick, prodding and pro poking each other to do the right thing, to do good things. To bring out a good reaction and a good result. And it, it requires us to be in contact with one another as he describes this matter of our assembling together. That's why we come together on a regular basis. In our case, we have four, four such assemblies every week uh, as it relates to our time together. And as you think about the things that your congregations where some of you are from, that you have those probably as well. And we think about that, but I want to address that in something else that comes up. And I thought this might be a, a because I kind of anticipated there'd be a lot of young people here today. Young people here today. I thought this might be a good topic to discuss because those of you who are high school, college, a little older, a little younger, you're going to be facing challenges. I think for many of us that are a little bit older, we, we just cringe to think about some of the challenges that you're going to face and think about not just challenges to everyday life, but challenges to your faith, challenges to what you trust in and what you believe. And one of those things is something that has come along and is not really all that uncommon, but it is something that often arises in people's minds where they, they dismiss the need for being part of a congregation. Amen. And really, when we ask that question and we say, should I be part of a church? I think it's something that the Bible addresses in a number of ways. And the question should not be as a matter of my preference, which is sometimes the way people approach it. I'm just, I'm just going to be a Christian at large. I don't really need to be part of a congregation. I just, I just kind of float around. I might attend somewhere. I'll just take care of things all on my own. But it really should be, does God want me to be part of a church? What does God want me to be? And when you think about what church means in its basic meaning, it is a collective noun. Now, it can be used in a lot of different ways. In the first century, when it was first, when we, when, what we basically go to as a reference for church, we recognize that it, it meant an assembly of people and it didn't necessarily refer to Christians, or even any religious group. It just meant a body of people. In Acts chapter 19, it's used of a riotous mob. <laughs> now we've come, our, our use of the word has come to be exclusively religious, but I just want us to recognize that just like God did with a number of terms, He took something that was in everyday use and gave it a particular meaning. So, so there are, of course, misconceptions about 
the church. There are misconceptions that we find about most of the things that are in the Bible. But basically, it means a body of people is what it means. To illustrate a collective noun, let's think about the way we use collective nouns in the animal world. We describe, if I say the word covey, most of us recognize that's a, a group of quail. And if I use the word herd, though that can apply to many different kinds of animals, probably for many of us, that's going to be a bunch of cattle. A group of cattle. And while there may be one herd, there's also within that herd, there are individual cows that make up that herd. We can use it in a lot of different collective nouns, you know, a gaggle of geese. I have no idea what the word is for a group of moose, mises. I don't know. <laughs> but when we think about people, it's describing the, the church, the word church is describing people. But when we see the church, as it's mentioned in the Bible, sometimes without any other qualifier, we recognize that he's talking about a particular group of people, his people. And in the Bible, it's used not in two different ways, but in four different ways in the Bible. To refer to his people. That is it's used universally of all of God's people. Everywhere on the planet. And throughout time. It's also used of a local body of Christians. Still one body of Christians. Meeting in a particular place. Functioning and working together. It's also used specifically. Especially in the book of Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapters 11 through 16 as he uses this word, when that church is assembled together. I used to object to the terminology, I'm going to church. But I started realizing that Paul basically uses it that way. That is that sometimes he's saying in church, there's things that are done in church, meaning when the church is assembled together. That local church is still there, even when it's not assembled together. It can still be identified, just like the universal body of Christ in this life will never be assembled together in one place, but it's still in existence. But the, when the local body is assembled, there are some things that the Bible addresses of things that go on in that assembly. What's done in church. So I don't object to that terminology anymore. We also want to recognize that sometimes the church is used simply not of any particular congregation, but simply describing what God's design is for the local church. It's viewed as the pattern of organization that the church has. And you'll see what I mean as we go through that. We think about the universal church. That word universal is not found in the Bible, but the concept of there being a universal church or there being one body, as Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4 says, there is one body, one spirit, just as you're called in one hope of your calling. And goes on with a number of other things that define the unity of Christians. We wouldn't ever argue there is only one congregation. You know, we know when we're thinking about a local congregation that there's going to be local congregations all over the world. We wouldn't say there's only one of those. There are numerous of those, but there's only one universal church. We also see that in Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, where it mentions that God is the one that adds people together in the church, in, depending on your version, the way it's worded. But Acts 2 and verse 47 in the New King James Version that says pray the people there that were converted in Acts chapter 2 that obeyed the gospel, that responded to the invitation that was made to them by the apostles on that day. They said they were praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Let me just make a comment about that. What if it was up to you to make a tally of everybody on the earth today that is really considered part of the body of Christ universal. <laughs> could you do that? You couldn't do it, could you? For a number of reasons. You don't know everybody. <laughs> you don't know everybody all over the planet. You, you'll never be able to meet all the people in the world. There may also be things because it relates to what's sincere and coming from the heart, there may be people that you may consider to be faithful Christians and God knows otherwise. 
And there's going to be people that maybe you consider not to be that God knows otherwise. God is the only one qualified <laughs> to really define that number. It would be equivalent with what is described in Revelation as the Lamb's book of life. It is those who have heard, believe, repent, confess, and are baptized into Christ. As Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26 and 27, it, it reminds us as we think about what it means to be a member of the body of Christ or, or the Lord's church. Ephesians chapter 1 says that the church which is His body, and when we're part of His body, then we become, we, we are indeed those that have been added to Christ. For, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus for as many of you were, as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's an appeal made to the Corinthian brethren with some of the divisions and things that they were having that they needed to remember where they came from that in fact they were the ones who had been added to His body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13 that says, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we have all been made to drink into one Spirit. And so you think about that being added to one body. We're baptized into, that is when we're baptized and we're added to the body of Christ, we are part of the Lord's church, the Lord's body. But there's also local churches. And I'm going to, use, I'm going to make a bold statement here. <laughs> Jesus built local churches. Not in the sense of a building, of course. I do think that's some misconceptions people have. Sometimes they talk about the church being a building. Churches exist without buildings. We read this morning from the book of Philemon of the church that was meeting in the home of Philemon. But, but there still is the idea of churches is something that Jesus built. We, we might apply this as we think about the universal church from Acts chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18 uh, 16 through 18, if, beginning there, and we says, Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is after Jesus asked him, Who do you say that I am? And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. That's, that's something that I think, when we consider this idea of how the church is to work together. How are God's people designed to work together? Is that just left up to man? Did God just say, just do it your own way? However you want to get together, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to support, however you want to worship, that doesn't fit what we find when we consider that He is the one that built the church. Now, we also think about this in regard to, in John chapter 14, what Jesus promised to His apostles. John chapter 14, this is among several places, that Jesus let them know, I'm going to be sending a message back to you. But notice the way that it's worded here. In John chapter 14, verse 25, He says, These things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in My name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. I find a great deal of comfort in that verse. That it's not up to, first of all, the memory of Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, James, Thaddeus, Simon, none of, or, or Matthias. None of these guys had to have a perfect memory to remember what God wanted them to say, to remember the things that Jesus had said. Because the Holy Spirit guided them in what they wrote and what they spoke after that time. I mean, what if it was up to you? What if you were one of the apostles and it's up to your memory of something that Jesus said three years before? How good would you do word for word? You know, some people are pretty good at word for word. I can give you the general idea of a conversation. I can't necessarily tell you the word for word. A week later, much less many years later. But this other part of this, when he says, He will teach you all things. What all things? doesn't mean he's going to teach them mathematics or Pythagorean theorem. or He's going to teach them the things that relate to what it is, to the work that they had to do, which is to tell people what it is to be a Christian, to tell them about how they're to work together. So when we find instruction that occurs 
in other texts beyond the time when Jesus was on the earth, and we find the example of what they put into place, we can say, this is still Jesus building His church. This is still Him putting in place the boundaries and the direction that He wanted it to have. And we find things like, for example, in Acts chapter 14, 23, when they had appointed elders in every church, they prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. We spent quite a bit of time in our Sunday morning class going over the instruction about qualifications and the work of elders. Why was there so much detail given? Was the, were those Paul's ideas? Were these things that Paul came up with? I know for the audience that I'm talking to right now, most of you understand, no, that wasn't Paul's ideas. This was God directing these apostles. The Holy Spirit was telling them what they needed to know and what they needed to say that would help us to understand. This is the same way Jesus building His church in the same way that you might hire a contractor. And you come up with a plan. And the contractor comes back and says, now what kind of flooring do you want in here? Or what, what color do you want the walls to be? And even as this is maybe passed down to other subcontractors, on the one hand, that the person who asked for that house to be built might use the terminology, we built that house. And they never, lay, they never drove a single nail. They might, the builder might say, yeah, I built that house. Whereas he used a lot of other contractors to get it done. We understand that in things like that, but we sometimes make a disconnect and start thinking that these things that are put in place by the apostles that Jesus appointed, by the prophets that were directly inspired, that we somehow dis make this disconnect and say, oh no, these are just their ideas about how the church is supposed to be. So not only do we have Jesus building the church in the sense of the universal, but even in the local. Take, for example, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14 and 15, which is right on the heels of the first part of that chapter, that is the qualifications of elders, where he says, These things I write unto you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I am delayed, I write so you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So as we find instruction, either given directly to churches in, in the books that are written to churches, or the instruction that's given to Timothy about seeing that they're setting things in order the way they are to be, we can be confident that what we're following is Jesus' instruction. Jesus' design for what His people are to do. Not only what they do, independently, individually, but what they do collectively as a congregation. It's God's way, not our way. So there's a number of things that God designed to be done, and I used that phrase a while ago, in church. I'm not going to read all of these references, but I'll make the references to you here. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Ken made reference to that before the Lord's Supper. The instruction about the Lord's Supper and the word, the phrase in church is often used in that context. This is what God designed not just to be done with us in a dark room all alone by ourselves. That's not what He designed it to be. He designed it to be a together activity. It's designed to be that way. It is a communion that we share together in. We, you, you find, for example, in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, they gathered to debt together to break bread. It was the, it was a, there was purpose behind their coming together was specifically in regard to the Lord's Supper and that on the first day of the week. You know, each one of these things that I'm going to mention here are things that we find that people have made variations to because it's what they want or because they think it doesn't matter to God. And I want us to realize that because God gave us the instruction and the example of the early church, it matters. <laughs> you know, how, how thick is the New Testament? I want you to do something. If you have your Bible, I want you to put one finger at the start of Matthew and the other one at the end of Revelation. And I want you to pinch that between your fingers. Do you ever think about how small 
the New Testament is, that's giving us instruction for living as Christians, that's giving us, and, and, and overall giving instruction about what God has done for us. It's a very small collection of words. Every word means something. It really means something when God is giving us instruction. So we have people in regard to the Lord's Supper. Some of them have decided that the frequency that we read about in Acts 20 and 7 doesn't matter. Let's just do it once a month, once a quarter, once a year. In fact, I've had people tell me that they think it's more meaningful if you, just, if you don't do it so often. I'm not going to argue with them about if they think a once a year celebration is more meaningful to them. But I will say what we find with the Christians in the first century is that they were doing it on the first day of the week. Now, last time I looked at the calendar, there's a first day of every week. If, if you work for a company and they said, we're going to pay you on the first of the month. And then the first month, first of the month rolls around and the month that comes up, you don't get a paycheck and another month rolls by and you don't get a paycheck. And the, and the business owner says, oh, well, I didn't say which month. <laughs> No, we understand that terminology describes both frequency and the day by describing it as the first day of the week. Some have removed some of the elements. There are some who only take the bread, do not take the fruit of the vine. Some have changed the elements. The unleavened bread is not even in consideration, even though it was during the Feast of Unleavened Bread that he incorporated it. We, we also recognize that the offering... Our, our contribution is something that is designed to be done together. Again, a reference to the first day of the week in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Interestingly enough, most of the people, if not all, that have argued with me that say that, that they really think it's too frequent to take the Lord's Supper once every week, I've never had one of them argue with me that they think it's too frequent to collect an offering once, day, once a week. In fact, most of them will collect offerings on every day of the week if they have a meeting that goes on that long. But we also have a number of things that although God shows us by example and instruction that they are included in our assemblies together, there are also things that may also be done outside the assembly. For example, for example prayer. It mentions in Acts 2 and verse 42 that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and the prayers. Maybe that would have been a verse to be inclusive of a number of these things that are mentioned here. But we, we recognize the importance not only of us having our private, all alone prayers. And let me re-emphasize that. That's very important as well. If the only time you pray is when you come together with other Christians, you're not praying enough. But there's also great benefit in us praying together. And you have references to this. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it mentions that we pray with the Spirit and pray with the understanding also. He mentions about the matter of if there's not any understanding in what's being said, how can they say amen at thy giving of thanks? That is, showing a hearty endorsement of what's being prayed. And so it includes the, the, the matter of us praying together as we are led in prayer. It shouldn't be that the man up front who's leading a prayer, he's the only one praying, is it? We're all praying. He may be leading our thoughts, but we're praying together. Our singing, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 15 that I quoted a moment ago, sing with the Spirit, sing with the understanding also. It should be that we're all singing. Sometimes people have replaced that with listening. I don't know that we've ever, ever think of somebody actively worshiping, or we shouldn't think of somebody actively worshiping, just listening to somebody else. It should be that we are participating in that. But in, much, in many churches today, it's become, we're going to take somebody who's going to perform for you, and you just listen. You can clap at the end, but you just listen. You don't actually participate. In fact, although sometimes it comes as a shock, and it may be to some of you, I've had people come in here that have said, uh, where's your piano? Where's your band? And that's not just because we can't afford it. I have a guy told me that one time. He said, you know, I'm, if I get rich, I'm going to buy you all a piano. 
I think he was joking, but that's, that's not what it's about. It's about respecting the authority of God's word. God tells us to sing. He doesn't tell us to play. If he told us to play, there's probably many of us who would not be able to do that without a lot of help. Well, maybe we need a lot of help with the singing too. But, but, that's, but the, the fact is, is that we can open our mouth and sing and it's, it's a way for us to praise God. It's something that God wants to hear from us. In, in Hebrews chapter 13, it's described as sacrifices of praise. And maybe thinking about that, you realize sometimes the sacrifices that were ascending as a sweet aroma before God were burning flesh. <laughs> May not have smelled too good to the, the human nose, but it was a sweet aroma because of the heart of the one that was offering that sacrifice. And it should be that we're offering this to God and recognizing that He is receiving our worship in that way. And it's something that we should all be participating in, not a select few. It's also important that we recognize, as Timothy is reminded about giving heed to the teaching and preaching of God's Word, that there was the attending to God's Word that we find that is addressed in all of Paul's writings and the importance of including that. And before I leave that subject, I just want us to realize that in many cases, as we think about what some churches have, have addressed, they get away from God's Word and they start looking at everything else that's going on in the world. You know, I'm, I mean, there's a lot of things that can be important topics, important discussions that just have no place in what we're together for. When we think about the organization of the Lord's church, it's a very simple organization. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1 addresses the bishops, deacons, and members. The word bishop is a, is a synonym, or at least it is used synonymously with the term elder and the word pastor, which itself has taken on a different meaning. I think most people kind of think there's a preacher who runs the church, and they think that's the way it's supposed to be. In the Bible, it's the elders that run, that run and oversee a congregation. And it is, as we read a while ago, it's elders in every church. Plurality in every church. There's also no authority for a larger body on the earth. Find it. Where is it? Where is, if, this, if this is the instruction, if we're letting it be Jesus who's given us the instruction about the way the church is to be, where is the instruction about how the hierarchy of the church is supposed to be built? It's not there. That's not His design. There is no international church organized in the New Testament. And there should not be today either. It should be the autonomy of the local church. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5, we find a phrase that describes that the church is the, the pillar and ground of the truth. That is, it's supporting the truth. And we find in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 15, where the Philippian brethren were supporting Paul as he traveled to these other places. We have a number of people that we support. There's a bulletin board on the left-hand side that's describing men in the Philippines and uh, Scott Tope in South Africa and... Uh, Tanner Campbell in wherever Tanner is now. Is he still in Arkansas? <laughs> and so, and, and others, uh, Jim Thayer and others that we help support. And we follow the instruction that's here as Paul wrote to the Philippians and he talked about them having fellowship with him in this work in the matter of the giving and receiving that they were providing his needs so he could focus on the teaching and preaching of the word. We also find that the church is providing for the needs of the saints. The reference in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1 and 2, describes it as the collection for the saints. And there are descriptions in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9 of those that were in various need because of certain circumstances and others that provided those, and the church is providing those needs in what is there. But there's an awful lot of things that in many churches today, they're supporting things that have nothing to do with the gospel and having nothing to do with the support, the provision for needy saints. The question comes down to this. Are, do we want to be God's church? Do we want to be Jesus' church? Do we want to be a church that's just comprised of the ideas and the whims of men? Do we trust God in what He's telling us and how we should be? 
But back to the question that we start, started with, does God want me to be a part of his church? Well, maybe to ask this for you, does he want you to be one of his? Jesus died for us. Specifically in Acts 20, 28, it says he died, he, uh, the church which he purchased with his own blood. And he's in this description there. He's talking about the responsibility of elders toward those Christians that are meeting with them and their need to be conscientious about their oversight of them. I mean, maybe just another question. Does he want you to be saved? Obviously he does. He, he directed the first century church of how to worship, how to organize, how to work. Why did he do this? Because really he did design the church to be the pillar and ground of the truth. He says, if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Don't let other people take you away from what God designed to be. Even if you don't even know why. We have sometimes people will point out just how beneficial it is to be together with other Christians. The encouragement we get. The help that we have with facing the temptations and trials in this life. The encouragement we can get in times of grief and sorrow. The reminder of what's really important. Back to the passage we had before the lesson, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, where it says, not, not forsaking your, the assembling of yourselves together, but exhorting one another. One of my favorite words, the word exhort. Yes, it means encourage, but, but it's a little deeper than that. It means to call to one side. It's descriptive of somebody that's got something to do and they're inviting other people and they're encouraging other people to join them in it. It's not like, go do this. It's let's go do this. It's us together to call to one side. We have, we have work to do. We have souls to reach. We have lights to shine. And we need each other through this life. I hope that you'll think about those things and also think about where you stand with God and really the last few questions that we asked. Does God want you to be saved? Well, He's demonstrated how much He wants you to be saved. And we don't have to read 1 Timothy 2.15 or 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 to know that God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. We can see it also in the demonstration that He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever believes in Him might not perish but have everlasting life. And that believing is not a passive belief, but one that includes repenting of those things that are in conflict with His will, confessing your faith in Him and be baptized for the remission of your sins. And if you haven't done that, we want to encourage you to make use of this time to do that. And I don't mean this as just a way to close out a sermon. I mean that with all my heart. I hope that if you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, not one person here who has lunch plans or other plans afterward is going to be bothered by staying a little bit longer to see you put on Christ in baptism. And if we can help you with that or in returning to Him, if we can help you in any way, come forward as we stand and as we sing.